Hi, I'm Mason Vale from Boise State University, and this video is going to introduce the idea of generic types in Java, specifically in the context of collections. If you've ever used a list class from the Java Collections API, you've encountered a data type in angle brackets that accompanies the collection type. For example, when you create an array list, you're expected to specify what kind of objects will be stored in that array list in angle brackets. The declaration and assignment might look like this. Array list of integers int list equals a new array list of integers. The reason for specifying the particular type of object that's allowed in the array list is so the compiler and runtime environment can enforce type safety. Only objects compatible with the specified type can be added to that array list. This is a big deal for ensuring program correctness. You wouldn't want to accidentally store something that isn't an integer in your array list and then have your program crash when you try to find, say, the square root of every element and get to hello. So if I declare array list of integers int list equals a new array list of integers, I'm allowed to add to that int list a new integer of value 5, but int list.add hello would not compile. You could, of course, write a new version of the ArrayList class for every kind of object you'd ever want to manage in an ArrayList, but that would be an enormous amount of code duplication where the only difference from one ArrayList to the next is the data type being stored. We get around this by using what are called generics, or generic types. These types are placeholders in the class or interface that aren't assigned until the program actually creates a new reference or object with that specified type. By using generics, we only need one class to store any kind of element, and it can be configured on the fly. It might seem crazy at first that a collection class doesn't need to know what it's storing in advance, but it makes more sense when you think about what a collection does. It holds objects, and then it returns them. It doesn't interact with those objects while it's holding them. At most, it may call the toString method as part of its own toString method, but that's a method every class will have. In the actual collection class, we specify the generic type with some placeholder value. E and T are the most commonly used placeholders because E is the first letter of element and T is the first letter of type. The placeholder can be anything, but sticking to conventions will cause you and other readers less confusion. The generic type is included in the class or interface header and everywhere else in the code where that type is needed. We're basically saying, once someone tells me what this type is supposed to be, replace all the generics with the specified type. Once the object is instantiated, all references to the generic type will be replaced with references of the specified type. When the constructor of this tiny bag example is called, you can imagine that all of the generic E's in the new object are replaced by the specified string type. Within the same program, you can have multiple collections with different specified types. Each collection object has the generic type specified when it was created. So here I have a favorite word object that's a tiny bag of type string, and I have a favorite number tiny bag that is of type integer. This slightly more complicated example shows that generics can be part of an interface that is then carried over into a class that implements that interface. Here, the bag interface declares a generic type E that is taken as an argument in the add method and is the return type of its remove method. When class small bag implements bag, it has to conform to the interface and use the required generic type as part of its methods also. There are more uses for generic types than we've shown in this video, but I hope this helps you get started using them, at least in the context of collections. Thank you for watching.